Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm going to give you a quick uh, excursion through where we at CNET uh, see the automobile playing into the things that we're all interested in here in this room. A lot of it has to do with media, products, communication, messaging. Uh, we often think about the car as being a transportation tool. That's what it's been for a century. Uh, but we know that there's change coming on a lot of fronts, and I want to kind of gather your thoughts a little bit just in a few minutes here on how you might visualize as we were hearing just a moment ago, in fact, Washington Post thinking about these same kind of topics and how we all very likely have an opportunity to move whatever we do, our message, our service, our offering, somewhere into or very closely around the car. Now, if this sounds like a brand new idea, let's step back right at the top here, 60 years, and take a look at some of the thinking that even back then General Motors had about how we might have a different relationship with the car. Hey, I wonder what we'd hear if I'd turn on the switch and we're driving along in 1976. You're now under automatic control. Hands off steering. Ah, oh, this is the life. Safe, cool, comfortable. Mind if I smoke a cigar? Oh, not with this wonderful air conditioning. There's already an early vision of a different way to relate to the car, thanks to some degree of early autonomy. But of course, back in those days, uh, the driver could only think about lighting up a cigar to spare his time, as opposed to doing something more interesting with media. Now let's flash forward to just a couple of years ago at the Geneva Motor Show, when Swiss boutique automaker Rinspeed did a concept that really brings it much more forward. Now here you've got a vehicle. Uh, based on a Tesla, as you can see. But the idea here is no longer about just sitting back and relaxing. It's about having a media experience in the vehicle, as well as other experiences. You can see the vehicle is going to have a lot of screens in it. Some are built in, some are brought in. And that's a very good indication of where we think the future is going to go. It's not just one player that decides what are the channels into the vehicle. They'll still be built in and brought in. And of course, a lot of this turns into a media experience because if you think about it, when the chore of driving is no longer foisted on everybody, what are you gonna do more of? Are you necessarily going to eat more on the road, drink more coffee, put on more makeup, read more newspaper? If anyone does that anymore, probably not. You're gonna use more media of the electronic type. Let's put the car in context now before I go into a few more details where it sits in the world of technology. So these are the six areas of tech that really are driving the world of media right now. The biggest one of them all is the next billion, the concept that we have another billion unique users still to come onto smartphones who are not there yet. This is the biggest single trend. Very large of well is the conversion of television into a streaming medium, the over-the-top revolution. That's also a major changer. The connected car revolution that we're focusing on today. And a little bit smaller is the area of wearable technology, smart and connected home, as Joey was mentioning earlier, and virtual reality. Notice that of these four major heat areas, uh, of these six, I should say, four of them are all media presentation platform re uh, re revolutions, the phone, the television, the area of virtual reality, eyewear and head-mounted displays, and even the car. Only two of those really aren't areas where media will be projected, displayed, and offered in the future. So this is a very robust set, but the car fits in there very nicely. As you talk about technology in the vehicle, you need to understand technology at its core. And when I say technology, you think about this. And this is not technology. This is just electronics, which is actually the least interesting back end of the story, to be honest. Technology has a dictionary definition. If you want to go dig one up, it goes something like this, depending which dictionary you want to pick up in what language, but it's basically in five simple words how we get things done. It's important to bear that in mind because that's the true core of technology. How we scratch an itch we already have, how we answer a need we already have an appetite for, not how does technology bend us around a vision that we didn't already have. I don't see a lot of successes over the last couple decades that actually tried to do that. You got to go where people live already, and that means you embrace four attributes. You bring technologies to the market, in car and elsewhere, that are transparent. That means they get out of the way as much as possible and get you a closer distance between you and the media or service or communication you want. You go toward intuitive. That means easy to use, but also make it very easy to understand why 
I would use it. This is going to be very important in the vehicle where we have a big shift in terms of what we do in the car. You've got people to think about doing something very different. It needs to be intuitive in both senses. Intimate is, of course, a given these days. Everything we do has to be designed and wrapped around, and I like to say almost like an organism that adapts to the host, the user, if you will, to put it in kind of biological terms. And finally, constant is my term for everything, everywhere, within reason. I'm not going to be necessarily watching movies as I drive the car now, but in the autonomous future, that is absolutely one of the expectations. Looking at full screen video, rich media, not just audio like we heard about earlier, but really full video experiences once we mature the autonomy to a significant degree. And it doesn't require that we have amazing space age robotic cars. There is an important middle ground we'll talk about. This next billion concept is important to connected cars because it sets the table. The reason we have an appetite now to begin to embrace connected cars as a media space is because the smartphone has already become the center of our lives. It is the hub that everything else turns around. We all know this. And the next billion is this idea that another billion unique users are coming online. And this is a literal and amazing number. I've been tracking this since 2014. I readjust these numbers about every end of each year as all the new research houses put out their projections. And the low case looks like this. We finished at about one and three quarter billion at the end of 2014. Uh, uh, this year, we should be at about 2.32 billion unique users worldwide. This is not units. These are individuals with a smartphone. And by 2018, we have gone almost exactly another billion in growth of users around the world. And again, this is a pretty conservative use case. You've probably heard some of the headlines in the last month or so that smartphone sales are cooling dramatically this year. This is still built in there, and we still get to another billion people in just five years within this window we're in the middle of. That's the most powerful trend in technology, and it sets the table to want those services, those communications, those experiences in the car as well. The car is one of the few places where we do not have legitimate access to the richness of the smartphone. We end up juggling the thing while we drive. Not a good solution. Three things are going on in cars, as you know. They're becoming electrified, very big for the industry. They're becoming autonomous. That starts to play toward our media discussion. And completely about our media discussion is they're becoming connected. And there are tipping points you see here that show that each of these three are very real, very real outcomes that are in the offing. None of this is pie in the sky anymore. So let me talk about why cars connect. Why do we have connected cars? There are four main reasons. One is for communication web and internet style communication in the car, which we don't typically have in cars today. Cars are mostly about Bluetooth calling. Some text messaging may come in if you have a very modern car, but you don't typically have a lot of web and internet style messaging in your vehicle. You need to, and that's where connected cars go. Navigation, it should be live search navigation. Our cars today typically have a stale, di fixed database of points and maps that does not reflect the real world, let alone our real world, my preferences, my history, my friends' interests and locations. That has to be there like in the phone, and it's not yet. Connected cars do that. Entertainment, we're moving to being more of a streaming culture. As we all know, most cars are playing catch up on that area as well. And finally, telematics, being able to locate your car, do some limited remote control of it, lock it, turn on the lights, check the charge if it's an electric vehicle. These are your big four, why cars will go connected, and they all print well to consumers who understand by their smartphone habit how these would be very elegant to have in the car. They don't put it in those words. They don't say it's going to be an elegant solution. That's the kind of words we all use. But they know that it just makes sense to them. This is all about my constant concept, so that what I do and how I live and what I relate to outside the car follows me in the car. I'm the same media and communications consumer in the car as out of the car. And right now, I am not. I have to change too many gears to get there. Interesting research from Accenture recently about what people care about in their new vehicle. And this zone you see here on the left are people who say, I want performance more than anything else. On the right, I want infotainment, connectivity, and electronics more than anything else. Look how the lobe over the recent years has swung toward infotainment in terms of the numbers of people who say, yeah, most important thing to me is this and this strongly. It's really swung to the right on infotainment. I can't tell you how many new car buyers, and I've been covering cars at CNET for 11 years now, uh, 100 reviews a year for over a decade. I can't tell you people I know don't really know or care what's under the hood, may never lift it unless the car stops running. This is a different era we're going into where the horsepower of a car is seen in services and its abilities as well as its ride and its space, but not necessarily how many cylinders do I have. 
Google and Apple, of course, are major forces in the dash. We're seeing a, a fairly good penetration of these guys in the U.S. I believe they're lagging much more in the European zone, but they will catch up. And the idea here is that you have, as you can see on these interfaces, as many of you know, you've got software that takes the best of iPhone, the best of Android, plays the hits, I like to say, and puts that in the dash of the car in a way that is recognizable already. It pulls in your preferences. It pulls in your universe from your smartphone world that it, it relates out to the Internet and pulls that into the car in a way that makes sense, relates to how you already use these services. It's very clean. The problem is car makers have a problem with this because this is taking away some differentiation that many car makers enjoy having. They enjoy their software, their presentation, their services in the head unit, and they want to keep those relatively exclusive. They let these guys in fairly grudgingly at this point, to be honest. I think in the end, though, services like these, probably these exact two, largely win the day as who is the presentation engine and largely the aggregator of services that come into the dash. Very important to watch, even though it's still small days. The growth curve on those, we uh, see about, about like yay over about a six-year period. We're in the, uh, the red bar right now is 2016. You can see the numbers get very big and, and grow with a very large growth rate each year as we get out in the next three to four years in terms of numbers of millions of cars, approximately 36, 37 million shipping worldwide with each of these systems. By the way, most cars will ship, ship with both. That's where you see the numbers track very similar. Very few car makers will say, we're an Android car or we're an Apple car. Although Apple wants to do their own car. That's a whole other discussion. We'll see if that ever happens. The car makers, as I mentioned, also want to be presenting media in the car in richer ways. Look at Volvo with this concept of, a, of an in-car cabin where you really have dramatic changes in the vehicle there on the left when you're in an autonomous mode to become a different person than just a driver. You lean back and have a real media experience. This is, of course, a concept, but this is not coming from a company that does a lot of crazy stuff and then abandons them. This tends to be a company that's very, uh, very thoughtful, in my experience, at marching forward on doing these things. Here's Audi in the middle with their very rich rear seat system for the Q7 that could easily migrate its same ethic to the front seat once autonomy is there. Cadillac's CT6, brand new model for them. They are actually shipping that car with a free Google Chromecast because they have an HDMI port that they've installed in the back. They have a very strong 4G Wi-Fi hotspot in the car. It's all you need. They say don't do anything with DVDs. Don't worry about connecting your phone. Put a Chromecast in the back that we're going to give you for free. It's only $35. It's not a big gift, but it's the idea that they're saying, use the same Chromecast and the habits and the preferences you have built into that account. Install one in your car as well to achieve constant. Same device, same interface, same preferences, same history. This is where the car makers and Apple and Google are, of course, going after the same thing and somewhat locking heads. This is a U.S. number I want you to think about. Why? we have so much time that needs to be addressed. In the United States, every day, 105 million individuals drive to work by themselves in their car. I don't think any other country has such a high number. That's why I use the U.S. here. The numbers are not as big in the U.K. or Europe from the research I've done, but this is a big number, obviously. And it's about 50 minutes per day that that consumer, those 105 million consumers are doing round trip to and from work. And that adds up to 88 million hours a day of time spent doing simple manual labor. Most of those people, I'm going to assure you, are probably, when they're driving, getting paid the lowest wage of their day, when they could be doing something much more valuable with media and communications, staying in touch with family, taking in media, whether it's entertainment, whether it's news, information, learning, whatever it may be that's rich and visual, as well as rich and aural, and that all comes from the car that is at least partly autonomous and, of course, fully connected. That's a big number. It's not trivial stuff. The big question of the age will be, what would you do and what will you do when you don't have to drive? Consumers don't have an answer for this yet because they've never had the option. The sampling of this is just about to begin. This is all new. Look at Google's car. This car is not notable to me because it can self-drive. They've already had Lexus vehicles that they built that can do that. This vehicle is notable because they didn't put a wheel or, or pedals in the car. It, by its physical nature, says to you, think about driving differently and asks you silently, what will you do when you don't have to drive? Almost anything is a better use of your time than this. 
Take a look at Volvo's creative from last year. I, got, I think another really good visualization here uh, of, of their Drive Me program, which is about to kick off in full uh, full force in, in, in Gothenburg, I think, later this, early next year. And the idea here, they're showing, uh, here's a woman going to work, maybe a little bit late, like most of us are, kind of, a, kind of a harried morning. We all know the feeling, right? Off she goes. And then driving to apparently the train station, now apparently on the train and heading on into the city center. And she's apparently a creative, and, and as she's taking some time on the train, she gets a creative idea from being able to have time to engage and look at the world around her do some work in the morning hours when your mind is very fresh, but she's not on the train. She's in the car. Personal transportation, the benefits of that and the benefits of transit where you have time to not manage the machine, but do something more valuable with your time. This is a very strong argument. And again, I think it's well visualized here uh, on, on how you blend the modes of having to drive in certain situations, but take back time in significant slices in other parts of your commute and your other driving you do. This is how companies are doing a very smart job of showing this. Now, autonomous cars are going to be a bit of a tough sell for a lot of consumers. Uh, depends who you talk to. You'll find pros and cons. The pros are pretty simple from the societal point of view. Reducing accidents is number one and a slam dunk goal. And personal time recapture, what I'm talking about here today, to use your time in the vehicle for something other than babying a wheel and pedals. You also get some smaller, not smaller, but uh, a little more distant social benefits, logistical benefits down the road. But let's take a second here and listen to Google's executive chairman, Eric Schmidt, as he makes it very blunt how he feels about self-driving cars, or in this case, us driving cars. Your car should drive itself. I, it's amazing to me that we let humans drive cars. Computers should drive cars. It's obvious, right? If you think about it, it's, it's sort of a, it's a bug that cars were invented before computers. Pretty, that's pretty stark. It's a bug that computers were invented, the cars were invented before computers. He doesn't think there's any role for humans driving. That's about as stark as a technologist can put it. That establishes one pole, right? That's over here. Consumers, in many cases, are over here, and they push back strongly with, wait a minute, I'm a good driver. I don't need that. The other guy does. Well, we've got accident statistics in every developed market that says, no, you're not, and graveyards full of people that make that very clear. I like to drive. We think we like to drive. Most of the time, we don't like to drive. We like the idea of retaining the ability to decide when we drive. And I don't think anyone in the automotive industry, connectivity or autonomy or otherwise, is saying that we ever take that away in any near-term scenario. I don't trust computers as a big one, because people are thinking computers as in Windows computer. We're talking about computers as in Airbus computer. It's a very different kind of computer. We've got to communicate that to consumers as well. The industry does to get that clear. These are very important areas. And of course, the biggest one, that every consumer will feel is, what will this cost, though? If you can get me a car that does all this magical stuff and changes my life, can I afford it? Because if we just push it out to the S-Class and the 7 Series, we haven't touched a lot of people. We've got to get that down in the 2 Series. We've got to get that in the Fiat Panda. We've got to get that in the Ford Focus. And that's tough at a five dollars to $10,000 estimated cost in the early years, but that will quickly come down as technology always does. The roadmap to this autonomy, before I take some of your questions, is happening right now. 16 is a really interesting year. Last year, of course, we had Tesla kind of break the seal on this idea with their autopilot and their summon technologies, which were very edgy to the point they had to walk a couple of small features back. They were almost too edgy. But they really established a benchmark, right? Now, in 2016, we're going to be uh, welcoming cars like the new Volvo S90, which will have a very strong degree of partial self-driving standard, not optional. The first car in production that you cannot get without a degree, a high degree of self-driving for today's, by today's standards. Also, the new 17 Mercedes E-Class uh, e will also have a, re a revolutionary degree of, uh, of driver assist that is basically an early stage of self-driving like the S90 does. Uh, we get into uh, next year, Cadillac will have something called Super Cruise, the first of the major American car companies to put out a wide range of vehicles that will be able to take over a large amount of the freeway traffic, like we saw in that Volvo clip, kind of the same idea. And then we even get a mass manufacturer like Hyundai by 2020 doing something very similar to what Cadillac and many others will do. You see the progression is only a few years. 2020 is a very important year before we turn the corner and head towards some of the more highly self-driving cars that we'll want to talk about in the years ahead. But we start to get the new free future, freeing up our time in the next three to four years. It's a very exciting time. So with that, I will be happy to take uh, a few of your questions.
Thank you.